Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You're not stuck in the middle in a place you're never going to get out of. You are going through. When you go through the fire, you won't be burnt. When you go through the river, you won't be overwhelmed. When you go through, yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Of course we're going through, but that's good news to the believer. So just a few realities. First reality, nobody and nothing is perfect. We say that, but then people go from church to church. They don't like this about their church, so they go to another one. Then they don't like something about that church, so they go to another one. And then they don't like that church, so they go to another one. Did it ever occur to you that maybe you're the thing you don't like at the <laughs> church you're going to? This is a true story. A woman was getting married for the seventh time. And our pastor was doing the ceremony and she went to him and said, Pastor, I need you to pray that this man will treat me right. And he said, well, you've been married seven times and you probably need to consider that you're the only common denominator in all seven marriages. <laughs> oh, oh. I just love to have fun when I'm preaching. <laughs> you know, we chase perfection when we're 20. <laughs> But by the time you're a little bit older, you realize that it's just a myth. And you just deal with it. Real life is not perfect. We might manage a handful of perfect days in a lifetime where every single thing went exactly the way we wanted it to that day. But if you just write down, I mean, I just wrote down a few things that happened in two or three days. I made an appointment at the nail shop. You make appointments so you can do something at a specific time. But invariably, when I get there, they've tried to work somebody else in hoping to get them done before I got there, and then I'm waiting 10 or 15 minutes. And that kind of stuff aggravates me. I'm not good with that. So pray for me that I can win <laughs> in that. My flight was late getting in. Kitchen sink stopped up. Got a generator on our house that we paid lots of money for. It's never worked right. Never, since the time we got it. 13 years, never worked right. It sits out there and looks pretty. Then when the power goes out, it doesn't come on. So we just had another big repair on it. They said, oh, the motherboard's out, and this is out, and that's out. And so we had all that fixed. First time it was supposed to come on, it didn't work. That was the test that I did not pass last week. And I carried on and ran it and raved for probably a good 45 minutes, and then I was exhausted. And it didn't, it didn't change it. It didn't fix it. I still had to call a repairman out and go at it again. So, is anybody with me? Okay, let, let's just a few scenarios. You're ready to cook dinner and discover you forgot to buy the meat. <laughs> options. We have options. In the Lord, we have options. Get upset, change the menu, Or keep quiet and go get the meat. <laughs> Somebody offends you or makes you angry and it catches you totally off guard. You don't display Christian fruit. Now you feel guilty. <laughs> Options. <laughs> you can stay angry, tell them off, make it even worse. Or you can repent to God, go tell the person you're sorry. Let go of the guilt and go ahead and have a good day. We always have options. And we don't have to be as unhappy as we are if we get just a little bit more realistic. What is getting upset really going to do to change this situation? I'm, I'm going to save you guys lots of wasted time next week. 
My sermon will only last about a week, and then somebody will have to come by and preach it again, because we, we have, well, maybe two weeks, I don't know. Perfect? Here's how you can be perfect. James 3, 2. For we all stumble in many ways, but if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a perfect man. So when you can get to the point where you never make one mistake with your mouth, then you can plan on perfection. There's only one perfect thing, and it's Jesus. And the Bible says that when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. Well, the perfect is referring to when Jesus returns again. And by the way, and this is the most interesting part, it's actually the imperfect things in our life that God uses to perfect us. Hmm. I'm going to say that again. It's the imperfect things in our life that God uses to perfect us. How do you learn how to love unlovely people? By having to deal with unlovely people. How do you learn how to stay stable in trials? By having trials. How do you get patience? <laughs> Come on. I love the scriptures about Jesus. It says that he was equipped and prepared for his ministry as our high priest because of the things he suffered and went through and experienced. Amen. Nobody can help somebody else like somebody who's gone through it. Amen. Come on. I said nobody can help somebody else like somebody who's gone through it. So when the devil really attacks you, you need to tell him, you're going to be sorry you did this because I'm, God's going to get me through this and I'm going to have some experience and I'm going to use it to help other people. All right, now we better go on to point two. You can't please all the people all the time. I'm going to write a book with that title. You cannot please all the people all the time. People pleasing. Why can't you please all the people all the time? Because everybody wants something different from you. And so you end up trying to be this and trying to be that and trying to do this and trying to do that till you lose yourself. And you end up finally realizing I'm not enjoying my life at all. And a lot of times in the process, we lose our destiny. We're not even really... God pleasers anymore because we're so busy trying to keep all the people around us happy. And if you want to really be the person God wants you to be, you're going to have to learn how to be rejected and not care. And I don't mean like it won't hurt, but you can't care so much that you get it to change your decision. Galatians 1.10, Paul said, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Am I trying to please man? And I love this. If I were still trying to please man, I would not now be the servant of Christ. He said he would have never become an apostle if he would have been trying to please man. And I can look back at my own life, and I'm sure many of you, just the fact that you've taken the stand that you've taken to be a more committed Christian, you have probably people that are close to you in life that have rejected you just because you want to be closer to God. And they don't. When God called me to do what I'm doing, there was nobody in the beginning that was for me. I mean, even Dave in the very beginning didn't like it. I mean, God dealt with him pretty quick, and it was just a few weeks, and he got on board, and, you know, we've been good ever since. But, because, you know, Dave's a wise man, and he, God just basically told him, I've called her to do this. If you do what I'm asking you to do, you'll always have joy. If she does what I'm asking her to do, she'll always have joy. If you try to do something I've not called you to do, you're not going to have joy. And really one of the main reasons why we've had this long time, very fruitful ministry is not just because God's given me a gift 
of communication, but he's given me a husband that's stable enough to let me be who I am. And I'll tell you what, that takes a great man of God. John 12, 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in him. But for fear of the Pharisees, they would not confess it, so they would not be put out of the synagogue. How sad is that? You know, Jesus was quite a revolutionary, and when he came along, the things he was saying and preaching didn't line up with the old religious world. He was just a little bit out of the box, <laughs> saying things that people didn't like at all. But when they heard him preach, they were convicted in their heart, and they knew that it was true. But it says right here, although many people believed in him, they would not confess it. They wouldn't come out bold and confess it for fear of losing their friends. You don't have a friend that's worth losing your relationship with Jesus over. Amen. Amen. And just real quick, in Luke 10, when Jesus sent the disciples out to minister two by two, he said, whenever you enter a town, Luke 10, 8 through 11, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you, heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. But whenever you enter a town and they do not receive you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your town that clings to our feet, we wipe off against you. Nevertheless, know this, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. So he's basically saying, look, Whenever people reject you, I'm sending you out to do a job. I'm calling you into a deeper walk with me. When people reject you, just shake it off. Don't let it bother you. Don't let it upset you. Don't let it cause you to lose your joy. Just shake it off. You know why? Because you can't please all the people all the time. Get confident enough in Christ to just believe if you don't want to be my friend, it's your loss, not mine. Amen. Amen. We gotta please God, not man. I recall a woman who met me in a restaurant one time. I still remember this restaurant. It was, you had to go, you went downstairs to the area where the restaurant was. And when we went down there, we were waiting by the hostess stand to get a table. I think we had a reservation and we were just waiting. And a lady recognized me from television and came over and started talking to me. So I was talking to her, asked her name, glad to meet you, all that. In the meantime, the waitress comes over and says, we've got your table ready now. So I said, it was good to meet you and went on. Next day, she called our office, irate. You say you love people. I would have expected you to have spent more time with me. I felt like you were really rude. And I don't like it at all. Well, she had an expectation, but her expectation meant she didn't care whether I got to have dinner or not, as long as she got what she wanted. And see, that's what happens a lot of times when people get mad at you and place demands on your life. They're not really thinking about you. They're mad at you because you're not giving them what they want, and they really don't care what happens to you. Amen? Amen. And you know, it's, I mean, we all want to be liked. That's human nature. You want people to love you and like you, but I'm just telling you, it's, it's an unrealistic expectation. And as long as you have that, you're going to always end up unhappy somewhere along the way. We expect people to understand us, and they're not all going to understand you. Reality at number three. <laughs> In the world, you will have tribulation. You know, that's a promise from God, just like give, and it'll be given back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. We cheer for that one, but everybody gets quiet at this one. <laughs> but Jesus said, in the world, John 16, 33, you will have tribulation, cheer up, for I have overcome the world. Let me ask you, how many of you are going through something right now? 
Well, you know what? You should be happy. You know why? Because you're going through. You're not stuck in the middle in a place you're never going to get out of. You are going through. When you go through the fire, you won't be burnt. When you go through the river, you won't be overwhelmed. When you go through, yea, though I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Of course we're going through, but that's good news to the believer because the world without Christ will never get through. But you're going through. And you're going to come out on the other side. It's like the disciples in the Amplified Bible in Mark chapter 4. Jesus said to his disciples, let us go over to the other side. I love this. Let us go over to the other side. Matter of fact, the first recorded message, which back then was on a cassette tape, was based on these scriptures. Let us go over to the other side. And what happened, the very next thing that happened after Jesus said, let's go to the other side, was a storm of hurricane proportions arose. And they couldn't find Jesus because he was asleep. <laughs> Don't, every storm is not in the forecast. Don't you love it when you think you're headed somewhere, you believe you're obeying God, and you step out, and then all of a sudden you got a big storm and you can't find Jesus anywhere? He got up and calmed the storm, and then he rebuked the disciples for not having enough faith and being afraid. And then the very next verse says, and they arrived on the other side. And I love that. Let us go to the other side. Almost any time you head somewhere that's going to be progress in your life, you're going to have a storm in the middle. I know it's not good news. I know that, but really it is, because if we're prepared to handle real life, just make a decision. This year, I am going to pass more tests <laughs> than I have ever passed before in my life. You're going through. Reality number four, we will all die. <laughs> Do you know how different I think now? That, okay, in four and a half years, I'm gonna be 80. So 14 and a half years, I'm gonna be 90. Now, Dodie has made me promise that if she lives to be 100, that I will get up and sing at her birthday party, which I don't sing. Now, I'm not saying I don't want her to live to be 100, but I thought about this today, Dodie. If that happened, you'd be 100 and I'd be 90. I have to sing, she says. But here's the thing. I have, I, in the last few years, I have looked at things so much differently because I know that it's not going to be all that long, and I'm not expecting to die anytime soon, but I'm a lot closer to it than I was, you know. I mean, sometimes I think, I am 75. And I'm like, really? But the Bible says in Romans 14, 12, Every man will stand before God and give an account of his life. Can you imagine with some of the stuff that's going on today and the ungodly things that people fight to get the right to do and how they're going to feel when they stand before their maker. Amen. And I don't want to end on some somber, sobering thought, but we need to realize that God sees everything we do. Everything we do.
And we cannot just act like a Christian when we're in church with all of our Christian buddies. It's everywhere we go. And especially behind closed doors. Who you really are is who you are when you think nobody's looking. That's who I really am. Who I am when I think that nobody sees me. The little things. Being a person of integrity. Things you could get by with, nobody would ever know, but God would know. Doing what's right just because it's right. I told some people today, I said, we were talking about some things about honesty and integrity and people keeping their word and being at appointments on time and stuff. And I said, I am glad that I had the privilege of living in an era when things like that were commonplace. Some of you are old enough that you know what I mean. I mean, you gave your word, you kept your word. You had an appointment, you were there. Are you called and let people know? You did what you said you were going to do. I, I mean, and even people that weren't saved had more morals than some Christians do today. Come on. And here's the problem we have now. We have whole generations now that don't even know what the word integrity means. Because we, I, I, I've had people ask me, well, what is integrity? What is it? And I tell you, if there's ever a time when we need really straight on, sound, solid Bible teaching, it's today. So if you're not entertained in every church service you go to, thank God, because you're not going to be entertained. You're going to have your life changed. Every person is going to stand before God and give an account of his life. Now, if you're saved, if you've received Christ, you're not going to need to give an account of anything concerning your salvation. You're already in. Why should I let you in? I believe in Jesus. But the Bible does say that we will also be judged on our works and that we will receive rewards for the ones that pass the test when they go through the fire. And I believe that's the fiery eyes of, eyes of Jesus. And the Bible says plainly, don't have time to go to all these places, but talks a lot about reward. Let me tell you something. Somebody who goes through this life that's not so perfect and stands fast and does what's right, even if they lose friends and all the things we've been talking about, there is a great reward I mean a reward. God's going to reward us. And frankly, when I get to heaven, I don't want to still be in kindergarten. I've worked hard. But the Bible says you can work hard and still lose your reward if what you do, if your motives aren't right. We can't do what we do to be seen of men or to be applauded or are to please men. We have to learn to live as if we really believe that God sees every single thing that we do. Is anybody with me tonight? Well, life won't always happen the way you want it to, but you can still have joy. All you have to do is stop thinking about what you don't have and focus on the hope that you have in Christ. om te dansen in de zon en te zingen in de regen. Een tijd om uitbundig te lachen en onbekommerd op avontuur te gaan. 
en om je vervelende broertje te plagen. Kind zijn betekent leren, groeien, geloven en dromen. Maar ook nu zijn er op de wereld heel veel kinderen die geen idee hebben van hoe je kindertijd zou moeten zijn. Ze zijn alleen bezig met overleven. Deze kleintjes moeten s'nachts vaak slapen zonder een dak boven hun hoofd. Ze hebben dorst, lijden honger en voelen zich eenzaam. Sommige van hen hebben zichzelf die dag meer malen moeten verkopen... voordat ze hun misbruikte lichaam te rusten kunnen leggen. Helaas is dit niet een verhaaltje over een handvol kinderen in een onzichtbare wereld. Nee, het is een keiharde werkelijkheid. Hier en nu, voor echte kinderen. Onze kinderen. Sommigen leven bij jou om de hoek. Anderen hier vele duizenden kilometers vandaan. Maakt die afstand dat een kind minder behoefte heeft aan liefde, bescherming en verzorging? Maken geslacht, ras of omstandigheden dat een kind minder deel uitmaakt van onze menselijke familie? Nee, toch? Een mens is een mens. Een nood is een nood. En een kind is een kind. Zo kostbaar in Gods ogen. In welke uithoek van de wereld een kind ook om hulp roept... wij moeten er gehoor aan geven. Op welke grond de tranen van een kind ook vallen... wij gaan erheen. We have traveled long. die ons hun steun waard vinden, zijn wij in staat om vele hulpbehoevende kinderhanden vast te pakken. Maar er zijn nog veel meer kinderen op de wereld die schreeuwen om hulp. Geeft u daar gehoor aan? Ze zijn op zoek naar een helpende hand. Helpt u ons mee om ze die te bieden? that your thoughts are random and meaningless? Or do they affect you more than you realize? Well, God's Word teaches us the importance of our thoughts. In Strijd in je Denken legt Joyce uit waarom letterlijk alles in ons leven samenhangt met ons denken. Actually, everything in life begins with a thought, even the changes that you might be looking for. 
Deze bestseller, met een oplage van ruim 6 miljoen exemplaren, heeft het leven van veel mensen al veranderd. Bestel strijd in je denken door te bellen met 026 20 22 100 of online via joy-meyer.nl slash strijd. Al ontdekt? Bemoedigende gedachten voor elke dag. Joyce Meyer Nederlands. Het bekijken waard.